Free will seems intuitive as part of our lived experience. We tend to believe that we are the sole originator of our thoughts and actions. And I wrote an article recently about this topic called Jesus, Guns, and Free Will, where I really excavated it at some great depth. But I'm going to talk here in this video about how genetics, environment, determinism, and randomness conspire to really limit the amount of free will that we have. So first I want to start with nature. We don't choose our parents, and by extension we don't choose our genetics. We inherit uh, chromosomes that determine our eye color, our hair color, our skin color, and obviously those traits in conjunction with our environment um, impact our behavior. Uh, but it's not just our morphology and physiology. Our genetics also determine certain behavioral characteristics. There is a gene for shyness and introversion and even for depression. And obviously we're not free from nature in many ways. We require oxygen and by extension we require photosynthesis largely of plankton and algae sitting on top of the water which produces two-thirds of, of the world's oxygen. So we are very controlled and dictated by the forces of nature. Now in 2003 at the conclusion of the Human Genome Project scientists were startled and alarmed to discover that we only have 22,000 genes or so. And how can that be? I mean we're so complicated and fascinating. <laughs> uh, and a fruit fly um, has 14,000 genes, so we have scant 8,000 more genes than a fruit fly. Um, and this discovery led to the emerging fields of epigenetics and, and the microbiome, and it turns out that inside your gut and your mouth and your nose and on your skin, you're housing trillions of fungi and bacteria known as your microbiome um, that govern and mediate a lot of your bodily functions, um, including and not limited to digestion and, and immunity. Um, so not only do you not control your own genes, um, but you don't control the genes of trillions of microorganisms that are living inside you, despite how much sauerkraut or fermented foods that you can eat to bolster the plethora of healthy bacteria in your gut. So you really don't have a lot of freedom from nature or genetics. Now let's look at the environment. Obviously you don't choose your culture, you don't choose your language, you don't choose the socioeconomic status that you were born into, you don't choose your uh, the religious or political affiliations of your parents that bracket how you look at the world. You don't choose your trauma or in some cases abuse. You don't choose um, the hegemonic influences of media. Just think of how much media influences and mediates your behavior and how you look at things. So you really don't choose your environment and that also has tremendous amount of impact on your behavior and your thoughts. So while genetics and environment seem to limit <laughs> a leave just a crack uh, of space open for free will, when you begin to look at determinism and randomness that door seems to or that window seems to abruptly shut. So determinism really is a, a set uh, of beliefs that claims that every event is caused by a causal chain of other events or prior causes. So let's just take a banal example and you can unweave these things in thought experiments all day long. Uh, let's just say you're going to a Japanese restaurant tonight, um, but your friend recommended that Japanese restaurant as something really good. Well, you only know that friend because you happen to see her in yoga. And then you're only going to yoga because you hurt your back. And you hurt your back because you were playing tennis. And you know, you were playing tennis because your dad taught you to play tennis when you were young. And your dad taught you to play tennis when you were young because he wanted to spend time with you. Anyways, you can unweave these things <laughs> all day long. But every event really is a byproduct of prior causes, of chains of causal events that preceded, that lead up to that event. And then of course there is randomness. Now this can occur at a 
uh, subatomic particle level with certain particles to randomly going one way or another in terms of their charge. Uh, but it's also, you can look at it as just random serendipity of like, well, that your friend that, rep <laughs> that recommended the Japanese restaurant um, just happened to be in that class that one day, or um, you forgot your wallet inside, which made you late by 30 seconds, and that 30 seconds um, saved you from uh, getting into a deadly accident. So there is randomness and serendipity that determine the course of human events all of the time. So beyond those four factors, and from a more philosophical perspective, in order to have free will, there needs to be a stable, reliable self to have it. And the tricky thing is the life sciences can't find it anywhere. The best we can do is sort of find a process which is called consciousness the awareness of phenomena um, arising and subsiding in consciousness from moment to moment. And really when we notice this phenomena, thoughts, emotions, sensations, feelings, when we really witness them, we realize that we don't actively produce them, they just appear. I mean, just over the course of this video, reflect on how many different thoughts came into your awareness and disappeared. You didn't put them there. They're just randomly flying in there. <laughs> um, now you can follow one of those thoughts or not. If you can witness it and watch it dissipate or you can you know, identify with it, et cetera. Now just think like, for example, fear. Like let, let's say this gnome, <laughs> Noam Chomsky behind me, was poisonous and a biochemical <laughs> process in my brain uh, formed under the pressures of selection and sometimes random mutation fires a neuron that then sends an electromagnetic charge for me to run out of the fucking room <laughs> because this gnome is about to kill me, right? So notice how none of that is my own production that that fear is something that just arose in consciousness and that my reaction was completely biochemical. Now, there are experiments that have been conducted by scientists in brain scanners where you can enter this brain scanner and this brain scanner will, um, it can determine your actions prior to your even consciousness of those actions. So, for example, I can be holding two switches and the brain scanner will know which switch before I, I'm going to press before I press it. Not only does that, but it'll actually know which switch I'm going to press before I even consciously recognize the thought of pressing which one or the other. Um, that is a <laughs> brain fuck to me, to be honest. But it does point to obviously like our very, very limited lack of free will. Now, before you get too depressed or frustrated and notice you didn't, if you are one of those things, you didn't create those, they just arose because you're frustrated. <laughs> but before you get too frustrated, I do believe that there is a window in that, that, um, that gives us some agency over our own life. That this is not fatalism. This is not prescribed. Now, consciousness does seem to grant us the ability to focus our attention. So, for example, um, let's say this happenstance with the scary poisonous gnome happens. I can actually watch that fear arise in my field of consciousness. I can examine it. I can not attach to it or identify with it, but I can watch it arise and subside such that the next time that gnome appears, I have, will have created a prior cause which will alleviate that fear from bubbling up and welling up inside of me. And I think that, again, this is possible not only with fear, but also with love and compassion. Anyways, this is a very pregnant 
um, complicated, nuanced, fascinating topic that has been a conundrum for thinkers and philosophers for a very, very long time. And I'm not going to solve it here in this Instagram video, but I hope it gives you something to think about. And if you're interested in delving into it further, please read my article called Jesus, Guns, and Free Will.